as uh, Jesus and the disciples leave the temple, as Jesus warns the disciples that the temple is going to be destroyed, the disciples ask him, right at the beginning of Matthew chapter 24 and verse 3, when will this happen? What will be the sign of your coming and at the end of the age? Now, Jesus' response to that question is really what unfolds in chapters 24 and chapter 25. It's what we've been exploring over the past three weeks. And really, this whole section is a bit like getting a look into Jesus' private masterclass on end times. Can you imagine if that event, Jesus' masterclass on end times, was advertised on Eventbrite? I'm pretty sure all the tickets would be absolutely booked out. But that's what we're getting to dip into. And what I want you to really know, because it's important for us to recognise today, that what the disciples are asking is a triple-barrelled question. People often like to point out to me when they read the small group material that I seem to like asking triple-barrelled questions. But I have to tell you, this is the ultimate triple-barrelled question. So in their minds, in response to what Jesus has said, three future events are coming rushing together. In the minds of the disciples, three events are rushing together. The destruction of the temple, the return of Jesus, and the end of this age. And as they put all those pieces together, it's a clue. It's showing us that they think this is all going to happen at once. They think the destruction of the temple is going to coincide with the coming king and his coming kingdom. But we know that's not quite how things play out. And so as Jesus unpacks his answer, we note he describes four different things. He describes an undetermined time of of turmoil in the world and in the church. We looked at that three weeks ago, and that, of course, continues today. He speaks of a specific time involving the destruction of the temple, which indeed did happen in AD 70. He speaks of a period of repeated deception, which of course has continued through every single generation that has followed. And then today, we see he speaks of a time of his return and the judgment of the world. And the key message is that in response to the certainty that Jesus is returning, we need to be ready. That's actually the focal point of all that Jesus shares privately with the disciples. So I want you to note, chapter 24, verse 42, Jesus says to them, therefore keep watch. And then a bit further on in verse 44, he says, so you also must be ready that because we have a certainty of that which is to come, it should shape the priorities of how we live today. That's the thrust. So in order to be ready, what do we need to understand? Well, I think Jesus shows us three things here. That Jesus is returning, the world isn't forever, and no one knows the hour. So first, Jesus is returning, you won't miss it. So we see Jesus' return is unmissable, unmistakable, and undeniable. A couple of years back, during the State of the Origin, or one of the State of Origins, I conceded to my small group, because we met on a Wednesday night, that if the series came down to a decider, we would suspend normal activities and have a special night to watch the game. Well, turned out... It was a decider, so I had to follow through with my word, and I tried to focus as much as I could on the game, and I thought I was doing pretty well until it became obvious that I hadn't even noticed that the game had finished until about five minutes after the fact. I had missed it. Sometimes people are worried that they're going to miss the return of Jesus. Somehow they'll be too busy, too distracted, in the wrong place at the wrong time, but that simply won't be the case. Have a look at verse 29. The sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from the sky and the heavenly bodies will be shaken. 
the image here is of a complete absence of light. If you've ever experienced a total solar eclipse, you know how eerie that is. It captures your attention. In fact, it captures everyone's attention. People can't help but be transfixed on what, what is happening. Everyone suspends normal activities. But this is far more dramatic. It's not necessarily that stars are, are literally falling from the sky, but that there is a complete darkening of the sky that spells massive consequences for the world. The emperors of the day in Jesus' time claimed that they had the blessing of the sun and the moon. And that's why if you look at some of the ancient coins, what you'll often see is a depiction of the emperor's face with the rays of the sun. They're saying, you know, they're blessed by that, they're in control of that. Nero even added new sun, S-U-N, to his list of grandiose titles about himself. But here we read of something amazing, that the news is clear, that not only will Jesus' return be totally unmissable, but it's going to be lights out. It's going to be lights out for Rome, it's going to be lights out for all other ruling powers as the true king arrives. And not only will this be unmissable, but it will be unmistakable and undeniable. So verse 30, Then will appear the sign of the Son of Man in heaven. Now, we're not really sure what the sign of the Son of Man is. What we do know is that it will be clear that Jesus is the one who follows. We're to be left without a doubt that anyone is thinking, oh, I wonder who that is. But also note that Jesus' role in judgment will be undeniable. And so we note that his arrival is accompanied by a period of unimaginably contrasting emotions. So picking up at 30 again, and then all the peoples of the earth will mourn when they see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a loud trumpet call, and they will gather his elect from the four winds, from the end of the heavens to the other. On one hand, all the peoples of the earth will mourn because Jesus' return will signal the judgment of the world. But on the other hand, God's people who have put their trust in the Lord Jesus will rejoice. No one's going to be able to mistake who this is. His authority will be unable to be denied which means there isn't a single place in which you can hide from his judgment. There isn't a single place which will make you unreachable if you're hidden in him. The rich and the poor, the good and the bad, the young and the old, the near and the far, the powerful and the disadvantaged, those who cycle and those who don't, we're all going to see Jesus clearly. There's a book series called Left Behind. It's been made into some movies and TV shows that you might be familiar with. And it wrongly claims that Jesus will actually secretly return and that whilst some will be rescued, other people won't even know that he's, he's come. Well, that's utter nonsense. It's not consistent with Scripture. When Jesus returns, it'll be unmissable, unmistakable and undeniable. Second, the world isn't forever but Jesus' words are. So pick up at verse 32. Now learn this lesson from the fig tree. As soon as its twigs get tender and its leaves come out, you know that summer is near. Even so, when you see all these things, you know that it is near, right at the door. Truly I tell you, this generation will certainly not pass away until all these things have happened. Heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Jesus' point is crystal clear. When the fig trees get tender and the leaves start coming out, it's a sign that winter is breaking and that summer is on the way. I know almost nothing about plants, yet I even understand this. The leaves aren't summer but a sign that summer is on the way. 
Like when you see the jacarandas come out, you know exam time is near. Or when it starts getting lighter earlier in the morning, then you know spring is drawing closer. When Jesus says, truly I tell you this generation will certainly not pass away, we're not sure if he means that these things he's saying now, things he's previously spoken of, we're not sure if he means that generation or, or a people group more broadly. But actually the, the bigger point is clear that we're not actually meant to get fixated on the signs themselves, but on what or who they point to. Because this will be the greatest event in the future of the world. They point to the return of Jesus, which signals judgment of the world. That's what is meant by heavens and the earth passing away. It's an image of winter being broken. Finally, the judgment of the world has come and the era of God's new creation has dawned. That sin, death will all be put away. That for all who trust in him, we are promised life forever with God. Now, depending on the type of fiction that you read or the movies that you watch, we can kind of oscillate between dystopian or utopian views of the future of the world. So we can have a dystopian view in which we kind of think it's all going to end badly. It's going down a spiral. Or a utopian view that we can kind of think that humankind and its prowess is on some sort of upward trajectory sorting everything out. We can kind of think that somehow humanity has totally got it on its own. We've got this. But actually, if we've learned anything, even the past few weeks, with uh, COVID-19 spreading all over the world, we should actually realise that actually we don't have it on our own. With a virus spreading in just a few weeks, markets have crashed, health systems get overloaded or at threat of being overloaded, supply chains break down, and we have to come to grips with the reality that actually we're fragile and vulnerable. We are subject and contributors to the brokenness of the world. That whilst there are good things and humans can do good, that actually the world is fundamentally broken and we need God's help. That whilst as Christians, what we do can show the love of God and point to God's coming kingdom, only God can fulfill it and make it complete. That's the promise we look forward to. That's what Jesus will fulfill. Jesus says, guys, learn the lesson. Let it sink into your reality. Let it manifest in your daily life, the pragmatics of your life. That given the signs that the time is coming, Jesus says, it's near. He says, it's right at the door, which means we should orientate our lives and invest our lives in that which will last. If we look at the world, if you were to pop up into space or just look at a photo, whatever's more practical for you, and you look at the world, it looks pretty solid. As the disciples looked at the temple, it looked pretty certain. But Jesus says, the only thing that will last are my words. I just want you to think how extraordinary that claim is. And if this is true, if we really believe it's only Jesus' words that will last, shouldn't that mean that our lives look distinctive in response to what he has said? Over the years, whenever Patrice and I have had to buy something significant for our home, be it appliances or furniture or something like that, we've always tried to spend a bit of time to find something that is good quality that we can afford that's going to last. And so we'll research it, shop around, ask questions, all those sorts of things. Might have to wait a bit longer or even pay more for it. When I trained to be a psychologist, I justified studying eight years of my life, because I thought it would be worth it, it was worth it, to try and have a godly influence in that area. 
I remember the first time I bought a pair of good boots. I had reasoned that it was worth it. I hoped that it was worth it because they would last. But I want to say, if it's worth investing, seriously investing in a profession or furniture or clothing on things that may last for a while but not forever... Shouldn't we be investing in and counting on Jesus' words which will last forever even more? Note this is both corrective and affirmative. Both that we shouldn't get caught up in the materialism or things that don't last. We shouldn't orientate our lives around that, make that the object and goal of our lives. But that also that we would use everything in this world, all that we have, our time, our professions, our energy, everything for the purposes of God's kingdom. That we would be letting the words of Jesus focus our priorities, correct our sin, shape our hopes, guide our decisions, influence our work, feed our hearts, direct our thinking, transform our generosity that we would value his words above everything else and that therefore we'd also want to share his words with the world. That our ultimate worth, our ultimate value would not be attached to the things that we have, the things that are temporary. That our ultimate worth and value would be attached to the truth of Jesus. The world is not forever, but Jesus' words are. And finally, no one knows the hour, so be ready. Taking a bit of a step back, I want you to note, Jesus' logic is so clear, it's very clear, that because his return is certain, and the hour is unknown, and that the arrival will be sudden, It should therefore radically and continually shape our lives. Often we're far more concerned with trying to figure out when Jesus is going to arrive rather than concerned with how he wants us to live. But Jesus says that simply won't do. In fact, he's freed us from that futile endeavour of trying to figure out the precise time when he's going to arrive because not even he knows the hour of his return. So we read verse 36. But about that day or hour, no one knows, not even the angels in heaven, nor the Son, but only the Father. Just worth considering how extraordinary that is for a moment. That the only person in the Trinity that knows the hour and the day is the Father. And so that would suggest, and be fairly obvious to all of us therefore, that if even Jesus does not know the hour or the day, how arrogant and deluded would it be for anyone to think that they do know? So if anyone claims to know, don't believe them. They're lying. Not knowing is meant to move us from complacency into continual readiness that we cannot afford to be distracted, for when Jesus comes, it will be swift and sudden. So he tells us, like in the days of Noah, people will be going about all the normal parts of, of life, eating, drinking, marrying, giving in marriage. But they had no idea what was coming. Or in verse 40, two people, they're doing the same thing, they're getting on with the work. Or in verse 41, two women are at the mill doing their jobs. Jesus' return will be sudden and decisive. You won't know when, we won't see it coming, and when it arrives, there won't be another chance. So what should we do? Should we be living with some sort of constant angst with bags packed and ready by the door, some sort of go bag for the future kingdom of God? I have no idea what that would look like, but uh, should we be staring up into the sky, a bit like the disciples were after Jesus' ascension? Or should we just go, well, that's all too hard, so I'll just push it out of my mind, push it down, push it out of the way? Now Jesus says, if you knew you were going to be burgled, what would you do? 
to be ready. So how much more should we be ready for the arrival of the Lord? So Jesus doesn't want us to be obsessed in trying to figure out the time, nor ignorant that he's coming back, but ready for whenever it may happen. That means that we must not be oblivious to God's purposes for judgment and salvation. That we know that the future is not just a timeline from now until the ends of our life, but from now for forevermore with Jesus' return in the future. And so we'd be vigilant, living faithfully and appropriately. That we wouldn't be waiting to live with him as our Lord when he returns, but that we would be living with him as our Lord today. Dealing with any sin that we might be living with, not delaying a decision to put our trust in his son. We're going to explore a bit more next week what it means to be ready, but the, the headline, the too long didn't read version is this, it's not about having your bags packed, but it's about having hearts and lives orientated to our coming king. So it's worthwhile thinking this week, are you ready? As you look on your life, can you identify even one way in which you can see the priorities of your life and the decisions that you make are being shaped by the certainty of Jesus' imminent return. The last couple of weeks, we of course have been absolutely flooded with information, rightly on how best we can be ready for the unfolding pandemic around the world and in Australia. With all the signs that there is something really significant coming our way. And so, in light of that, we are faced with two choices. We can either see the signs and take action, that would be the responsible and loving thing to do, or we can kind of think recklessly and foolishly, in, in actually a very Australian way, she'll be right, <laughs> and just carry on. Friends, it won't be right, and nor will it be if we're not ready to meet our King. The signs are plain to see, just as Jesus warned. Remember? Turmoil in the world and in the church? Check. Destruction of the temple and Jerusalem? Check. Repeated cycles of those who will come to deceive? Check. And now only one thing remains. The return of the king in judgment. No one will miss it. Only his words will last. And his arrival is imminent. So let's be ready. Let's pray. Gracious and loving God, we thank you so much for the good news that Jesus is returning. We thank you, Lord, that there is an end day and time that only you know, in which sin and death, pain and suffering, all the brokenness will be dealt with. Lord, we want to acknowledge right now that we cannot possibly do it on our own, that we desperately need you, and we thank you that you have opened up a way through Jesus' death and resurrection that we might be saved. And so, Lord, we pray that not knowing the hour nor the day, yet certain of Jesus' return, that that would not leave us complacent, but that we would be motivated to let the certainty of that future shape the priorities of our lives every single day. Lord, we please ask in your kindness and the power of your spirit, please make that so real to us, so clear to us, daily, hour by hour, how we long for your son's return. How we long that many will come to put their trust in him. And so, Lord, we pray that it would help us to shape our lives around that which will last forever. In Jesus' name, amen.